Welcome to the Cardiac Emma Learner Series, a unique video tutorial program under the aegis of Indian Association of Cardiac Imaging. This program is focused on beginners and intermediate images with learning happening through short sessions and case-based discussions. We are grateful to experts from different parts of India who have helped us in putting this program together. Please do feel free to give us your feedback so we can continually improve such training opportunities. This session is brought to you by Dr. Pudhyavan, who is a lead consultant radiologist in cardiothoracic imaging in Kowai Medical Center and Hospital, Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. He has expertise in adult and congenital cardiac MR and CT with interest in interstitial lung disease. He finished his initial training in Apollo Heart Center, Chennai, and then took up his fellowship in Narayana Institute of Cardiac Sciences and is a level 3 CMR certified radiologist from the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging. He has 10 publications in national and international journals and has been a part of the organizing committee for a number of CMEs and conference on cardiac imaging. Hi everyone, I am Dr. Pudhyavan, consultant cardiothoracic radiologist at Kowai Medical Center and Hospital Family. We will cover in the basic CMR sequences and see how to optimize the images. The objectives of this talk is to briefly see about the hardware needed for cardiac MR and optimal patient positioning. We will also go through the common cardiac MR sequences and how to optimize them and at last see the standard protocols for cardiac MR. When we talk about hardware, cardiac MR can be done with either a 1.5 Tesla or a 3 Tesla system. The advantage of a 1.5 Tesla system is that it has less susceptibility artifacts and produces better quality cine images. The 3 Tesla system provides us with better signal to noise ratio and shorter scan times. Second is body versus dedicated cardiac coils. The body coil is easily available and has good signal to noise ratio, but they result in a high specific absorption rate due to RF energy deposition. The cardiac coil on the other hand, has better SNR and a low SAR. However, they are prohibitively expensive. So, though theoretically a dedicated cardiac coil is desirable, a body coil will do most of its job at an effective cost. Metallic leads are cheap but produce lot of artifacts and there is a real risk of magnetization and projectile formation. Graphite leads, though expensive, doesn't have the other negatives and are preferred. The other hardware required are a respiratory gating balloon, MR compatible infusion pump or co and contrast pump used for perfusion imaging and contrast enhanced angios, MR compatible monitor with SIBP, PO2 and ECG monitoring facilities and an MR compatible anesthetic equipment, especially if you are doing stress examinations. Proper patient preparation is an important step in cardiac MR. Always obtain all previous investigative reports like ECG, echo and angiography. At least two hours of fasting is preferable. If stress cardiac MR is contemplated, then make sure there is no smoking or caffeine intake by the patient for at least 24 to 48 hours before the study. And also ask for a history of asthma as asthma is contraindicated when adenosine infusion is given. Also ask for history of contrast reactions though it is rare with MR contrast agents. A good renal function is also needed with an EGFR of at least more than 30. Also, proper explanation about scan duration 
and noisy environment of MR gantry is needed. Coming to patient positioning, make sure there is no free metal on patient by using a metal detector. It is always preferable to change to hospital ground. Use graphite leads for ECG. There are different configuration of lead placement and we have found this L configuration as most efficient. Make sure the patient is in supine position and is comfortable with the body coil on the anterior chest wall. There should be no air gap between the coil and chest, chest wall, especially in thin patients. ECG calibration is necessary both outside and inside the MR gantry to obtain reliable R waves for proper grading. The magnetic field induces electrical activity in moving body fluids which interfere with ECG tracing and is called the magnetohydrodynamic effect. This produces a tall T wave, ST segment elevation or depression and R wave inversion. The gating can be either retrospective or prospective. Most of the cine and phase contrast images use retrospective gating whereas morphological imaging uses prospective gating. ECG gating identifies the R wave using software and synchronizes the pulse sequences using a controller. This provides accurate imaging of the desired cardiac phases throughout the cardiac cycle. Though the magnetic field vectors are parallel within the MR gantry, they are not homogeneous throughout. The magnetic field inhomogeneities are least at the center of the magnetic core and are more at 3 tesla than in a 1.5 tesla system. However, it is desirable to obtain a homogeneous field at the center of imaging volume. Since the heart is eccentrically placed within the thorax, it is very difficult to position the patient such that the heart is at the center of the bore. Shimming is a process of obtaining field homogeneity over a desired area. Some vendors provide manual shimming options like below where you can place the green shim box over the desired area. Gradient cine sequences are more prone to field inhomogeneities. Shimming is useful in reducing these artifacts in gradient echo images. Frequency scout is another way to alleviate artifacts when manual shimming options are not available. This is utilized to determine optimal resonance frequency offset and the optimal frequency is visually chosen in which the artifacts are least. In the below image multiple short axis gradient images are taken with different frequency offsets and the image with the least artifact and the maximum contrast is chosen for further imaging. In this image we can see that the image J has the least artifacts and most contrast. The routine black blood image obtained are basically spin echo images while the white blood image are obtained from gradient echo sequences. The cine images use a balanced steady state free precision or a spoiled gradient echo sequence. The ECG triggered T1 and T2 black blood images are obtained by a double inversion TSC sequence while still images are obtained using a triple inversion TSC sequence. The dynamic profusion sequence uses a hybrid EPI technique to obtain the images most of the time. The SSFP and spoiled gradient echo images can also be used for obtaining dynamic sequence. The delayed enhancement image are obtained using a fast gradient echo sequence with phase sensitive inversion recovery. The flow images use a phase contrast for velocity and volume data. 
the T1, T2 and T2 star mapping images are parametric pixel level mapping techniques which are dealt with in separate talks. Spin echo sequence with a 90 degree RF pulse and 180 degree refocusing pulse provides a black blood contrast. This is because the transverse magnetization of blood flowing through a slice that moves out of the slice between the two pulses is not refocused by the 180 degree pulse and does not contribute to generation of a signal. Black blood images are used as morphological images and are resistant to field disturbances. However, they can result in ghosting artifacts especially when there is slow flow of blood or in plane blood flow. Gradient echo sequences produces white blood contrast due to rapid RF deposition and gradient switching causing a saturation of static tissue and bright signal from flowing blood. The white blood images are used for cine sequences due to its rapid scan times but are susceptible to field inhomogeneities. So it is imperative to use shimming or frequency scouts while doing gradient echo sequences. Two types of gradient echo sequences can be used for cine images. The first is a balanced steady state free precision image which is used for functional cine imaging and here the tissue contrast is dependent on the T2 by T1 ratio. The second sequence is the spoiled gradient echo sequence which can be used for functional cine imaging for contrast enhanced MR angiography for flow images and in T2 star imaging for ion quantification. Both these sequences can be used as breath hold as well as free breathing sequences. A number of parameters can be modified while obtaining cine images. The first is the number of phases. We routinely acquire 24 phases per cardiac cycle for functional assessment. However, in uncooperative patients and in arrhythmias, it can be reduced to up to 12 phases per cardiac cycle below which functional assessment is unreliable. The higher the phases, higher is the scan duration but smoother will be the cine images. Phase percentage is the percentage of phase data used in image reconstruction. Ideally, it is kept at 70% and should not be reduced below 50%. An increase in NSA increases the signal to noise ratio of the image and the scan time. However, there is more motion artifacts when the NSA is increased. Cine images usually use retrospective gating. However, in the presence of severe arrhythmias, a prospective triggering can be used. In the presence of phase wrap, phase oversampling can be used to prevent a phase wrap. However, this will increase the scan duration. The ECG gated T1 and T2 black blood images are based on a turbo spin echo sequence. The turbo spin echo sequence consists of a single 90 degree R of pulse, which is followed by multiple. 180 degree pulses. Reliance on spin echo sequence alone for nulling of blood is inconsistent in heart due to in plane flow and slow blood flow. So, a double inversion sequence uses two 180 degree inversion pulses, which is followed by a turbo spin echo sequence. Here, the pulse sequence is triggered after a predefined time from an R wave. As you can see, the double inversion sequence consists of two rapid 180 degree pulses. The first is a non selective 180 degree pulse which inverts the entire tissue, whereas the second is a slice selective 180 degree pulse which re inverts and normalizes the particular slice. Once the normal TSC sequence is now run after a predetermined time, the blood 
that is nulled by the non selective 180 degree pulse moves into the slice and hence it pro produces no signal. This provides complete nulling of the blood within the imaged slice. The stiff black blood image is similar to the double inversion black blood image. It uses a third 180 degree inversion pulse to null signal from fat, hence a triple inversion recovery image. It is used for edema imaging to look for myocardial edema and is a breath hold sequence. Here you can see an image where signal from both the blood and fat is null. Here this is a triple inversion recovery sequence which is similar to the double inversion recovery sequence but also has an extra 180 degree pulse which is used to null signal from the fat. So this is a still image where we can see significant myocardial edema in the anterior segment. The myocardial perfusion imaging is done using a fast dynamic sequence. It needs a single shot technique that can provide an image in a single cardiac cycle. There are three types of sequences that can be used for this purpose. The first is the fast spoil gradient echo sequence which is the slowest among the three but is less prone to artifacts. The SSFP based sequence provides the highest signal to noise ratio and the contrast to noise ratio but is more prone to artifacts. The hybrid echo planar imaging or segmented EPA is the faster sequence and is less prone to artifacts and is the most commonly used. Hybrid EPA is the most commonly used dynamic sequence. It uses a 90 degree preparation pulse followed by echoplanar imaging acquisition that gives a T1 contrast. Multiple sections can be acquired in a single RR interval in this sequence. P reduction is an EPA factor reducing which increases the signal to noise ratio as well as the scan duration. So the lowest possible P reduction need to be selected for a given heart rate. The images here show the first pass perfusion of the myocardium at the basal, mid and apical cavity using an hybrid echoplanar imaging sequence. Dark rim artifact or DRA is a common artifact in perfusion images. It manifests as a transient signal void at the interface of blood pool with endocardial surface and can be easily mistaken for subendocardial perfusion defects. They can be differentiated from true perfusion defects as they typically last only a few heartbeats. They can also cause the myocardial signal intensity to drop below the pre contrast baseline value. This artifact is worse at a stronger contrast concentration. The dark rim artifact can be reduced by using parallel imaging techniques, by avoiding using SSFP sequence and reducing the contrast concentration. This is a snapshot image of perfusion done showing a true perfusion defect in the septum marked by arrowhead and the dark rim artifact along the endocardial surface in the inferior and lateral walls marked by the arrow. The TI scout or loop locker sequence is designed to find the optimum inversion time to null the normal myocardium. It uses an inversion recovery gradient echo sequence with incremental TI times before each image readout. The usual range used is between 150 to 550 milliseconds at 1.5 tesla. The TFE factor increases the number of readouts per RR interval and hence can be increased to reduce the scan duration when heart rate is low. This is a TI scout image 
which shows a reducing signal intensity of the LV cavity as well as the myocardium with increasing TA. And once the nulling point is reached, further increase in TA causes an increase in the signal intensity of the myocardium. Delayed enhancement imaging uses a multi-shot technique over multiple RR intervals. It is based on an inversion recovery fast gradient echo sequence with a fixed inversion time to null the normal myocardium. The TI time is selected using the TI scout images. Early gadolinium enhancement images use a fixed TI of 440 milliseconds at 1.5 tesla and 600 milliseconds at 3 tesla. They are used to look for microvascular obstruction and thrombus. In the image here, the TI time is selected such that the readout happens at the time of nulling of the normal myocardium. The PSIR or phase sensitive inversion recovery is a modification of the fast gradient echo sequence which increases the dynamic range of the signal. Here the image is represented on a grayscale on both sides of the Z magnetization vector, thus widening the range of TI that can null the myocardium. These are PSIR delayed enhancement images showing nulling of the normal myocardium, which is black, and the fibrosis seen as hyperintense signal in the mid anterolateral segment. The PSIR sequence can be modified based on patient parameters. A high heart rate with short RR interval will not be sufficient to allow the recovery of Z magnetization between pulses. This can be overcome by using pulsing every second RR interval or by using a shorter trigger delay. A large voxel size can also be used at the expense of spatial resolution. The TI nulling time, if it is very high, pulsing can be done every second RR interval. Single shot delayed enhancement techniques can also be used in uncooperative patients with free breathing. It can be acquired in one or two beats, but the spatial and the contrast resolution will be poor. Flow imaging is used for quantitative flow assessment. This is based on the principle of velocity related phase change that happens in the moving protons in blood. Here, a bipolar gradient in opposite directions is used in a spoil gradient echo sequence where there is a phase difference between stationary and moving protons, which is proportional to its velocity. Wink is the parameter used in this sequence which denotes the maximum measurable velocity range. It should be as close to the actual velocity as possible for accurate measurements. An abnormally low wink results in aliasing while a very high wink underestimates the flow. This is a flow image of the MPA showing significant aliasing. The flow analysis also shows an abnormal flow curve with a spurious flow parameters. This is another flow image of the aortic valve with aortic stenosis showing significant aliasing on the left side. Once the wink is increased, the aliasing disappears on the right side. Before we finish, I will just outline the standard cardiac MR protocols for common cardiac pathologies. In case of viability or ischemia imaging, we need to do a black blood axial of the chest, two chamber, four chamber, three chamber, and LVOT CINES, a short axis CINE stack from base to apex without slice gap for functional and volume analysis, a dynamic perfusion in so short axis. Three slices at base, mid, and apical cavity, both stress and rest. A TI scout 
in short axis to determine the nulling time. A delayed enhancement short axis tag from base to apex to look for delayed enhancement or myocardial fibrosis. Delayed enhancement can also be repeated in two chamber and four chamber views. A phase contrast flow of the iota and the MPA is also taken and finished off with post contrast T1 vibe to look at extra cardiac structures. The imaging protocol for cardiomyopathies is similar to viability with the addition of still images to look for myocardial edema and T1 and T2 mapping if they are available. In congenital heart diseases, in addition to the regular sequences, an axial cine stack is obtained for RV volumes and a contrast NGO is done to look for aortic dimensions and MAPCAS. A post contrast 3D T1 is also done if it is available. If it is a complex congenital heart disease and normal routine imaging planes are not obtainable, then a true coronal and sagittal cine stack can be obtained. Certain special sequences are needed for other cardiac conditions. For example, in case of mass, thrombus, or pericardial pathology, a T1 and T2 double inversion TSC sequence in short axis or four chamber, depending on the location of the lesion, can be obtained along with a post contrast T1 fat set TSC sequence. A short axis dynamic fast free breathing cine can be obtained to look for constrictive pericarditis. Whereas T2 star imaging of the myocardium and liver can be obtained to quantify iron deposition. A three chamber cine with higher number of phases up to 40 can be taken in cases of HOCM to look for the anterior systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet. AV valve can be imaged through cine sequences with a thin stack. Again, axial cine stack can be used for RV volume quantification. To conclude, it is important to know the hardware available and its limitations. Do a proper patient preparation and obtain a good ECG tracing. A basic knowledge of sequences used will help in obtaining good quality images. And there are very limited parameters that can be modified to improve image quality by the technician or radiologist. And always follow scan protocols for a given clinical question to avoid unnecessarily prolonging scan duration. I thank you all and look forward to your feedback in the comment section. Thank you very much.